We're delighted to be here in Glasgow in generous partnership with the Common Guild as part of the Glasgow International 2018 to bring you this discussion, Artists and Authorship, Reference, Relationships and Appropriation in Contemporary Sculpture. We extend our deep thanks to the incredible Katrina Brown, Director of the Common Guild, and all of her team for helping organize tonight's talk. Though I think many of you are familiar with it, before the discussion begins, let me give you a bit of background on the Nasher Sculpture Center. The Nasher <laughs> is a museum born from the extraordinary collection gathered by private collectors Patsy and Raymond Nasher, who spent decades seeking out exceptional modernist sculpture that they believe to have paved a way for ever more imaginative modes of the art form. The collection spans from the likes of Rodin to Calder to Magdalena Abakanovitz and Anish Kapoor. In addition to highlighting works from the permanent collection, the Nasher Sculpture Center also presents ambitious contemporary exhibition programming. Recent exhibition artists include Maitu Pere, Giuseppe Pannone, Melvin Edwards, Michael Dean, and Ronnie Horn, to name a few. And in just over a week, we open the first sound sculpture ever to be presented at the museum, a work commissioned in partnership with Lismore Castle Arts, Ireland, by Glasgow's own Luke Fowler. In the spirit of the Nasher's commitment to excellence and innovation, in April 2015, the Nasher Prize was inaugurated, the most significant award in the world dedicated exclusively to contemporary sculpture. It is presented annually to a living artist who has had an extraordinary impact on the understanding of the art form. Each winner receives a $100,000 prize conferred in April of each year. Our inaugural laureate was Colombian artist Doris Salcedo. The 2017 laureate was French artist Pierre Puig. And this year, we celebrated American artist Theaster Gates. These laureates are selected by a jury that includes artists Philida Barlow and Huma Baba, Pablo Leon de la Barra, Guggenheim Curator at Large, Latin America, Lynn Cook, Senior Curator, National Gallery of Art, Washington, D.C., Okwien Wezor, Director Haus der Kunst, Yuko Hasegawa, Chief Curator of the Museum of Contemporary Art, Tokyo, art historian Alex Potts, and Nicholas Sirota, former director of the Tate and now chairman of Arts Council England. And this coming year, we add art historian Brian E. Fair to the jury as well. Complementing the Nasher Prize is a series of public programs called Nasher Prize Dialogues, of which this discussion tonight is a part. These panel discussions, lectures and symposia, made in partnership with other institutions around the world, such as Museo Humex, Mexico City, Academia de Kunst, Berlin, and Institute of Contemporary Arts, London, and the Henry Moore Institute, are intended to foster international awareness of sculpture and to stimulate discussion and debate. Held in cities where the practice of sculpture seems especially vital and conversations around sculpture are especially resonant the dialogue series offers engagement with various audiences, providing myriad perspectives and insight into the ever-expanding field of sculpture. Tonight's talk here in Glasgow, Artists and Authorship, Reference, Relationships, and Appropriation, will consider questions around ownership, originality, responsibility, and ethics in contemporary sculptural practice. These are issues that, more and more, in this era of globalization, pluralism, and openly shared information, create the most compelling and challenging discourse, not only in the art world, but in the wider public, about rights, roles, duties, and the limits of the artist. We are excited to explore these fascinating and urgent themes more closely this evening in conversation with a number of artists whose practices readily compel new thinking about sculpture and its powers at this moment. Guiding us through this terrain tonight will be Katrina Brown, founding director of the Common Guild, which presents an international program of artist projects, events, and exhibitions. 
She was also director of the Glasgow International Festival of Visual Art in 2010 and 2012, including the commissioning of major public projects by Suzanne, Susan Phillips and Jeremy Deller. In 2013, the Common Guild curated the Scotland Plus Venice exhibition for the 55th Venice Biennale with an exhibition of new works by Corinne Sworn, Duncan Campbell, and Haley Tompkins. Most recent projects include exhibitions by Anne Hardy and Thomas DeMond, a group exhibition for Lismore Castle, Ireland, and a major new project by Simon Starling in collaboration with theater director Graham Ito. Katrina also served as associate curator to the nationwide project Generation 25, Generation 25 Years of Contemporary Art in Scotland, taking place in 2014. From 1997 until 2007, she was curator and deputy director of Dundee Contemporary Arts, which opened in 1999, where she curated major solo projects with Scottish and international artists alike and a number of significant group exhibitions. In 2011, she was awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Glasgow in, con in recognition of her contribution to the arts in Scotland. We're so very grateful to Katrina for all of the thoughtfulness and energy that she has committed to tonight's discussion. With this outstanding group of artists, Christine Borland, Sam Durant, and Mark Leckie. Without further ado, let me put the evening into her capable hands. Thanks very much, Jeremy, and thanks um, from all of us at the Common Guild for the opportunity to work with the NASHRA on this event. It's been a joy to bring it together. I hope it's as uh, enjoyable to experience as a member of the audience this evening. Um, I also have to do the really boring stuff about housekeeping and ask you to please either switch off or silence your mobile phones. And we're not expecting any fire alarm tests, so if you hear something that sounds like a fire alarm, it's probably best to head to one of the fire exits. Um, the event has been photographed, as ever, by the brilliant Alan Dimmick at the back of the room. He really hates attention being drawn to himself. Um, and it's also being live streamed, so we should just say a quick hello to the people that are joining us by the marvels of modern technology. Um, I also, I'll be doing this a lot, but I really want to thank Mark and Christine and Sam for accepting the invitation to do this. Um, it, I couldn't possibly have imagined three better people to have this conversation with. And, it's really, um, it feels like a real privilege to have them in the room with us tonight. Um, if we're going to take a bit of an amble through our topic this evening, I've got a bit of a preamble um, to frame the discussion, but I also wanted to say a few words about this room because I'm conscious that even for those of you who are from Glasgow, you may not have been in this kind of incredible room before, uh, the Trades Hall of Glasgow, and it's got this rather nice distinction of being let me get this right, the oldest building in Glasgow is still in use for its original purpose, apart from the cathedral. I think the apart from the cathedral bit is always quite important in that sentence. But it was, uh, it was designed by Robert Adam in the 18th century and built in the 1790s. And it was designed and built as the home to the 14 incorporated crafts of Glasgow. And they're still active here today. And their names are around the frieze that is above our heads at the moment. And it's a space that we've used um, for talks and events before. It's always felt like somehow the relationship between the common guild and these um, ancient crafts is maybe a nice one. I particularly have always liked the bonnet makers and dyers. I don't know how active they are these days, but it's nice to have them in the, in the picture above us. Um, it is also, though, I think important to acknowledge that like so much of this part of Glasgow, um, the merchant city, it's not without a problematic history. Um, this area of Glasgow uh, is built by and named after people who amassed huge fortunes on the back of the exploitation of enslaved labour in the West Indies. And um, the so-called tobacco lords, those of us in Glasgow will be familiar with that phrase. It's not just these buildings, but the streets around here, Glassford Street, Ingram Street, Dunlop Street, Buchanan Street, they're all named after people who amassed this wealth. And it's a really horrible aspect of Glasgow's colonial past that has gradually, fortunately, become more widely acknowledged in recent times. And it, I thought it seemed fitting to make reference to it today. Um, and it's also maybe important to let the sirens past 
and then just maybe take a moment to recognise the gender of all the people in the portraits around us. Uh, so some things have changed. <laughs> Um, so we're going to be talking this evening about the material of contemporary sculptural practice and through the prism and perspective of Sam, Christine and Mark's um, experiences as, as artists. Um, the use of material that may be the fruits of someone else's labour, the use of things that may be owned by someone else. Touching on issues of ownership, yes, perhaps also ethics. Maybe legality, but hopefully not the intricacies of copyright law. I don't imagine that's a route that we might want to go down. Um, but of course, material is not just about physical material. It's also about ideas and histories. And Mark said this fantastic thing that's been ringing in my head while I've been thinking about this, that uh, there's wood, there's clay, and there's Samsung. And <laughs> it's really kind of stuck with me as a sort of... Um, echo of the extent to which not just brand names have become part of our sort of common language and common parlance, but also that technology has become such a massive material to work with um, as sculptors and artists working in three dimensions. There's a near infinite range of things, of course, and that's never more evident than a, a time like this when Glasgow International is across the city. I mean, just off the top of my head, I can think about Margaret MacDonald Macintosh's designs that are in Rosie O'Grady's piece at the House for an Art Lover, about Anthony Burgess's Enderby novels, which are in the project by Graham Etoff and Stephen Sutcliffe at Film City. Um, there's also a 15th century text that's in Tai Shani's uh, piece at Tramway. I'm not going to list all the pieces in GI that use existent material, but that's just uh, some of the ones that come to mind. And there's an idea about free reign, you know, do artists today have free reign to work with everything and anything that they want? Artistic license being a phrase that's uh, been used in the past, although I have to say the phrase artistic license always makes me think about a television docudrama, you know, the idea that it's meant to be factual, but it also has to be entertaining. Um, the other uh, art form reference, I suppose, is sampling in music. There's a lot of reference to the idea of sampling in writing about art. But also, how, how does existent material come to be in an artwork? How does it get there in the first place? And what is fair game? Is everything fair game? Or is anything fair game? Well, technology, and specifically the internet, has undoubtedly opened up uh, entire worlds of reference and things we may never have had access to before. Maybe societal change has simultaneously sort of closed down opportunities for things to be cited in artworks. Does, does that curtail the scope of possibilities? Is there a risk that we all end up clicking through the same chain of references in Wikipedia to find the same results? And what's appropriate? Appropriate takes us to appropriation, and that word is, of course, bound to pop up, <clears throat> but not in the sense of appropriation art of the 1980s. People like Cherie Levine and Richard Prince and various other artists who will be well known to everybody, but that might be a useful reference or backdrop to think about what we want to talk about today and I'm never one for reading out definitions in situations like this but I'm just about to do it anyway. Um, in the handy freeze A to Z of contemporary art that was published a couple of years ago um, there's a sort of mildly tongue-in-cheek uh, section under J called jargon and it's an attempt to sort of update Ray Raymond Williams's keywords and the definition in there of appropriation is very common often used as a euphemism for theft slash immunity from the copyright laws that the rest of us have to follow, which I thought was quite useful. And interestingly, on the following page in that text, it goes on to define a panel discussion as <clears throat> interesting subjects turned into interminably long-winded conversations, commonly found in museums, biennials and art fairs, statements by audience members <clears throat> disguised as questions, <laughs> are optional. <laughs> so there's a lot to get through and it might be good to get going. And just to say something about the format, there are some images of Sam and Christine and Mark's works uh, looping on the screen there as a sort of backdrop to our conversation. Um, we're going to try and have as fluid and informal a conversation as it's possible to do in a room like this. And there'll be an opportunity towards the end for questions from the floor. And at the very end, there's an opportunity to have a drink together and have a proper informal conversation. So I wanted to really kick things off by asking Mark and Christine and Sam to maybe just talk in the most perhaps straightforward way 
about something recent that might be relevant to this conversation. And of course, um, Mark currently, <laughs> to put you on the spot, has an exhibition at Tramway, which has only been open for 10 days, two weeks, I suppose. So I know it's fresh and raw, but I thought it would be really useful just to hear a little bit about how that piece came into being, how Nobodaddy, if that's how to pronounce it, came about. How did you find him? Um, I found uh, online, I found it, I came across a, a little, an image of, it's actually, it's in the Welcome Collection in London, and it's a statue of Job, so you say it, isn't it? I it's think not so, Job, yeah. Job, from the Bible, um, and I, I liked, I just liked it, I was, I, I'd had an image before of a, of, a, of a man in a polka dot dress that I was quite taken with and I wanted something with holes in it. <laughs> I wanted an image of a man with holes, like a permeable figure and, um, and he, have I not turned this off? I'm sorry, can't you hear me? It was, it's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start again with a bit more air. Uh, uh, did you hear any of that? Yeah. You did? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, little figure, lots of holes in it. Uh, Job, which I wasn't... I basically I spent all the time trying to push him away from Job. I didn't want the Jobness. I wasn't interested. And I didn't want him to be wounded either. But I don't know if I succeeded in either of those things. Um, like I say, I just wanted them to be full of holes. And, and then I wanted all of his, basically I, I tried to write this, I wanted to write a song. I, but the thing I had in my head mostly was, like now it's not so good to mention Kanye, but, uh, <laughs> but the end of uh, Runaway, does anyone know the mm. end of Runaway, where mm -hmm. he, where he kind of, with the vocalizer, with mm -hmm. the vocoder, and he, and he, um, it's like this mechanical anguish. I kind of wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what I was after. Mm -hmm. It's some kind of. I wanted it to be quite raw in what I said, and I think I kind of bottled it. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think. I wrote a lot of uh, lyrics and, and in the end didn't use any of them. But the, anyway, the idea was I wanted it to be medieval. I wanted it to have this kind of medieval um, language, a bit like Thai with the 15th century references. And I wanted all of the limbs to speak while a head remained kind of dumb mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that was that was that was what i intended to do it didn't i don't know if it ended up like that and what size was the original figure he's about that big right and then it got scaled up by this by people here mm -hmm. a guy called i don't know if he's here uh emil mm -hmm. and painted by this scene painter uh belinda <coughs> gilbert scott uh and and then there's a video so he's looking in a screen, he's looking in a mirror, which reflects tramway, but it kind of jumps. He's meant to be in some kind of VR space, mm -hmm. and he's kind of, and he's turning things on with his bowels, <laughs> with his bowel movement. Um, I don't know, I was, yeah, I was looking for some, I was looking for some figure that I could, <laughs> that I could use as a puppet, essentially. Yeah. And, the, ti and the titles for. I found, I mean, it's such a fantastic I have phase. no, I, I don't ever not find things. Yeah. I can't, um, I can't materialize things out of my own mm -hmm, mm -hmm. imagination. Mm -hmm. I have to have, I have to have something to work with. Mm -hmm. And that was from a William Blake poem. It's a William, ba right? William Blake poem. Mm -hmm. no, where it is a reference he makes to Nobo Daddy who's like, it's a, it's a kind of pun on God, the father of all. It's no, nobody's, nobody's daddy, daddy, but also no body. It's a daddy with no body. Mm -hmm. I just, it's just got a nice ring to it. Yeah. The God thing's a bit. I was trying to get away from Job in the Bible, and then I crashed into that. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do very well there. But I can't <laughs> help evoke or invoke Blake. Yeah. Uh, I keep, yeah. Yeah. Blake and I was going to say Kanye, but I can't. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's not spend the day talking about Kanye. I was just watching that tonight. I was just watching a bit on a uh, TMZ with the uh, what's his name Van. Has anyone seen the full video? It's kind of amazing. Maybe we'll save that for later. Well, watch that later. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, and Christine, the images that are cropping up uh, across Mark's mm. shoulder um, of the sort of white um, sculptures that you made, I think, in two thousand sixteen, um, called Positive pattern. Would you be able to say a little bit about those and what, what those stemmed from? Sure. Yes, like a lot of um, my works, it's a work that really took many years to sort of come into being from the initial idea and that's that's something that um, is, is quite important. But this is really a, an incredibly long time. Um, the first piece of work in this series um, if you like, was made in 2011 at the Peer Arts Centre in Orkney as part of a show that was doing there. Um, they have a permanent collection as well, which includes a really beautiful Barbara Hepworth piece um, called Oval, um, a very modest but incredibly complex um, carved wooden um, piece from the 1940s. So it was a bit of a, a very simple kind of fan girl need to engage with um, with that piece and um, wanting to get hands on with <laughs> it and get to know it better but of course you know there are there are limits with um, a priceless piece like that <laughs> but also in the context of the rest of the exhibition and um, with Orkney itself lots and lots of archaeology going on there something I was really interested in was experimental archaeology where Re, the remaking of um, finds is mm. sort of a, a really important part of the field now mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. local sort of potters are working with shards and patterns and trying through actual making using the raw clay of Orkney and um, Neolithic firing sort of methods are trying to sort of engage mm -hmm. and find out more about um, what had up to quite recently been quite an academic sort of dif discipline. So that kind of remaking was very much in my mind mm -hmm. and um, I worked with a company to laser scan the Hepworth and to attempt to visualise the interior of it. Um, so to make what was <coughs> negative, what, what was a hole into something positive. So it was an incredible, as soon as I saw the, the model um, in the computer, the 3D model, it was a phenomenal shape that you just couldn't imagine mm -hmm. coming out from any other, you, you know, in, a, in any other way. Mm -hmm. So how to reproduce, how to replicate it, um, there's a matter of cost <laughs> as well as many other things, but the actual material itself is really the cheapest, um, material that you can use for making prototypes through CNC milling. Mm -hmm. So your computer model is hooked up to a milling machine. You have a block of this white CNC foam, kind of creamy, and then it's um, carved mm -hmm. <laughs> in, a, in a really, well, in a hands-off way, but of course, you know, there is a, a degree of, of putting it together and stuff. <laughs> so that was 2011, and then trying to think, well, I want to I want to do more. There's a series of, you know, half a dozen of these Hepworth sculptures that were made around that time mm -hmm. um, that all had these kind of carved complex interior shapes. But not all in the collection of the Peer Arts Centre? No, there was only so that one. Owners. They're worldwide. Right. Um, one in it, there's several in the UK, but also one in the Smithsonian, one in Wales and a collection in Cardiff. Mm -hmm. So all around the world. But simultaneously, um, I was asked to um, do a commission for an institute for human transplantation in Newcastle. And that was quite a tough gig because it was a new institute that was built in a place where um, people who are needing um, a replacement organ will come and get the transplant. So they wanted something in that space to mark the donor's role mm -hmm. because the donors are you know, scattered all. It was a kind of north 
whole of the whole of Scotland and the north of England really the donors will come mm -hmm. from so to kind of mark that somehow so it was a challenge um, and you know I spent maybe sort of a year or so talking to families mm -hmm. observing mm -hmm. what was going on there and began to think that there was a way to bring the two together very simply simple reasons and complicated reasons the simple reasons are that what, what we've got in these works are an interior structure that can't exist without the outside, mm -hmm, but the outside, mm -hmm. you know, is not there. You've got something mm -hmm. um, that survives independently of, of another form. Mm -hmm. um, also, talking to the, talking to the, the parents and the, the relatives, their stories, the parts of the stories that really struck me were they were talking about things that were very, very physical, like, for example, meeting the person who had their son's heart beating inside their body and not doing it, but just wanting to, to touch. Yeah. So really evocative, but a lot of very physical descriptions mm -hmm. that I wasn't necessarily expecting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But also talking to young medics who were all about the future um, of this um, of, of transplantation being in new materials and new methods and that they describe this as a moment in time where we're doing our best with what we've got but this will be looked back mm -hmm. on as, as medieval yeah. surgery as yeah. yeah. it'll be just you know so they were talking about you know 3d printing and mm -hmm. matching and growing organs and new technologies mm -hmm. that made me feel it was appropriate to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, I just luckily um, lucked out with the <coughs> Hepworth exhibition at the Tate mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I managed to sort of do... So that was the moment that you there. got access to the sculptures? Yeah, yeah. And was there multiple sort of negotiations with all the different owners? And um, well? Yes, there was, and with the Hepworth Foundation, yeah, of course, course yeah. um, to do yeah. that. But I mean, it is, a, it is a technology that's becoming sort of known in museums now yeah. um, and in heritage in general, you know, yeah. 3D scanning heritage sites. Um, so um, it, it, it really, it wasn't actually that difficult to no. gain these permissions, but of course, in terms of all the kind of ethics of, you know, what would Barbara say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. just kind of dealing with that and yeah. thinking it through and, and talking to them about it too. So. And just when I was hearing you talk about the sort of medical aspect of it there, I was thinking through, you know, materials and, and things that you've used mm. uh, in works in the past, which have included, you know, human cells yeah. and, uh, a human skeleton at one point, albeit a long time ago, just oh. thinking about all those kind of incredible materials and the contrast, Mark, with when I had a, a list in my head of things that I really remember from works of yours, there being a, a big fridge freezer <laughs> and a packet of Benson and Hedges cigarettes and, you know, all these kind of, it couldn't be more different in some respects, but a similar kind of, uh, like a shopping list of these things, you know, that gives some kind of flavour of the field of you know, references over time, lots of different sort of technological things, I suppose, when I think about works of yours, the speaker systems and things like that. But wanted to move on to Sam now, if that's all right, Sam. And I've got this brilliant list of things that you've used before <laughs> <laughs> um, that your work's been sampled from rock and roll history, minimalist and post-minimalist art, 1960s social activism, modern dance, Japanese garden design, mid-century modern design and self-help literature. So that may have been written a couple of years ago, so there's probably been some other things that have come into the, the mix since then. But I wondered if you could say a few words about your show um, in LA, I think it was last year, with that rather nice title, Build There For Your Own World, which we've got some images of um, coming through the cycle and just how those works came about. Well, um, yeah, that, that was a, the, uh, a show um, at the gallery that I work with in LA uh, that, that kind of grew out of a public project that I did uh, in, in 2016 in Massachusetts in a sort of small town uh, outside of Boston called Concord, Mass, where the... Um, Concord, Mass. Ye conquered, yes, where the first battle between the British and the American colonists took place. Apparently, almost every town in that area says the battle took place in their town. <laughs> Concord has the monument, the national monument. 
Um, and I was invited to do a project, a public project there at a, at a historical house, which is right next door to the National Monument. It's called the Minuteman Monument, where this first battle took place. Um, and the house <clears throat> at the time of that first battle in 1775 uh, was occupied and owned by uh, William Emerson, who was the minister, Unitarian minister in the town and the, and the grandfather of uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, whom some of you may have heard of, um, writer, philosopher, theologian, abolitionist. Anyway, he, he saw the battle from his kitchen window and went off to uh, join the, the um, the newly forming American army. Um, and the reason he could do that was because uh, he owned slaves. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and several slaves lived in the attic of the house at the time. And this sort of, when I was invited to do this project uh, at the house, um, this was the thing that really struck me was um, the fact that so many of the, uh, so much of the, of the first beginnings of that army were, were uh, uh, came from either um, people who had enough wealth to own slaves to then, so they could join the army and, you know, keep their farm running and their household running, or they sent their slaves to serve for them in the, in the army. Um, and this is completely, uh, you know, invisible in, in those towns in Massachusetts, particularly in Concord, which has also has a, a comparable, a comparably wonderful history of being um, very important in the abolitionist movement, sort of, um, you, you know, uh, 50, 60 years later, um, which is very celebrated there. Um, and so all these ironies started to sort of pile up there as I was invited to do the project. Um, uh, Boston, uh, I grew up in Boston, um, and I, I went through the period in the 1970s of the sort of forced integration of the school system. It had one of the, one of the most segregated school systems uh, in the 60s and was forced by the federal government to, to, uh, to integrate the school system. It turns out, as I was researching this project, that uh, um, Boston's school system is now as segregated as it was in 1968 when they started the process. Uh, the town of Concord um, has the same African-American population percentage today as it did in 1775, except that the majority of those African-Americans are in the prison in the town. So all, you know, the, of course, when I started the research, um, uh, Michael Brown had just been killed in Ferguson, so the Black Lives Matter movement was forming, and, and there was a big controversy in the town, um, and, and that was the context. So <clears throat> I did a series of uh, public uh, events at the house um, uh, around these issues, um, and, and did a number of different kinds of things. Um, in a way to bring up this situation and ask the question like, you know, 250 years later, why are things more or less <laughs> the same? And what can we do to, you know, think about um, changing the situation? Uh, and it was, it was an interesting uh, experience for me because, you know, the, the town is um, uh, very wealthy, very liberal um, politically um, and, you know, still sort of 87% white. Um, so it was a really you know, difficult thing for the town to, to deal with. Mm. Um, and there was a lot of resistance to it. Um, but on the other hand, there was, there was quite a bit of uh, um, uh, interest and, and you know, sort of, um, we tried to kind of build things that would carry on, you know, structures for discussions and things like that. Um, and so those works that you see up here are... Exactly, known, actually. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, one of the ideas that came out of that, that project was um, how, how interconnected we are, you know, looking at history and, you know, and, and thinking about 
um, while Africans were forced to come uh, to, the, to, the, to North America, um, you know, uh, the next step from that is how much the people who were there, the people from Africa who came and the generations that came after those first people, how much they created America, how much they created American culture, American life, society. And, you know, somebody like Ralph Waldo Emerson, that, that piece where you saw the chair and the kind of table intersected, um, the desk itself is a, is a reproduction of Phyllis Wheatley's writing desk. Uh, Phyllis Wheatley was the first published African-American poet um, who lived in Boston in the 18th century. Um, and was, was bought by a family in Boston, brought from Africa, and educated. Mm. And then eventually, at the end of her life, freed by that family. Um, but they helped her to publish her poems actually here in England. They couldn't be published in the U.S. at the time. Uh, and Ralph Waldo Emerson, of course, was one of the founders of transcendentalism and a sort of one of the important kinds of constructions of American identity and our, our worldview, uh, you know, our, our sort of separation from Europe mm -hmm. comes from someone like Ralph Waldo Emerson. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to put them together to show how much he, you know, not able to acknowledge it in his lifetime, but, but I think looking back on it, how much he owes to people like Phyllis Wheatley mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and how much we all do. Yeah, you yeah. Know, we're, and we're that process of sort of interweaving and things being uh, affected over time, you know, that very much chimes with this idea of um, Ohomi Baba, who uh, Jeremy mentioned earlier on, said this brilliant thing about culture is itself an act of citation of reference, response and transformation, you know, that, that things develop through accretion and change and being co-affected and, and intermingled, I suppose. Um, I mean, it's interesting hearing the extent to which historical things, and you know, Mark, you were talking about the Job figure, which I think is 18th century. That's certainly what the notes say. Um, but, you know, I wonder how the, the time involved in some of these things whether that makes a difference. If something's really deeply buried, if it's 200 years old, 250 years old, does that make a difference to how you might think, any of you might think about using it or how it has the chance to sort of speak to a contemporary audience versus something that's, you know, like a fridge freezer or a, or a you know, something completely contemporary. And I know, um, again, Mark, some of the images of yours from the universal addressability of dumb things, mm. to get the title right, have I got the title right? Yeah. You know, this idea of having a kind of green screen or a sort of unifying backdrop to disparate objects has always felt to me like a, a, a way of indicating this idea that now when you look at things online, as you did with your figure of Job, like everything's equal, you know, so the Job figure is equal to the Kanye video or the, you know, and that, that uh, distance of history is somehow either eroded or, or sort of absent? Would, does it, does it feel, yeah, I mean, would, would, I don't know how you would each feel about that. Do the things that are further back in time feel like they're more freely usable or, or does it not make any difference? I think there's, you know, there's a, I mean, I made that out of, I, I did this talk prior to that called uh, In the Long Tail, which was all about this now kind of sort of discredited theory of economic theory about the internet how how the internet will kind of destroy uh, monopolies essentially would kind of smash um uh, you know all the big kind of brick and mortar newspaper publishers and and music industry and all the rest which to some extent it did but they've kind of rebuilt in some other way but the idea of the long tail was also that, that, that so if you had this thing, it was called a, it's called a power law, and it's like at the top of the power law is a head, which is like basically a concentration of whatever, wealth or, and that's 20, it's a ratio of 20 to 80, right? It's like the one, it's like one to 99%, right? Mm -hmm, or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, and then all the rest of the stuff down, down the tail is just basically niches. And this idea of the long tail was that all these niches would, would kind of, through the internet, would kind of come together 
and basically equal the head, right? So you've got this different distribution, essentially. And that was, that was what that was about. And out of that came the idea of doing this uh, universal addressability. It was originally going to be called Phantom Objects from the Long Tail. <laughs> And I was looking, you know, I was, I was just basically Googling. Mm -hmm. It just came about from a kind of Tumblr mindset or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. But now I think that idea of the long tail, although it's sort of discredited in terms of like Amazon and uh, Netflix and all the rest of it, part of it still holds true, which is the idea of things being sort of a, a sort of bottom-up distribution, mm -hmm, do you know what mm -hmm, I mean? Mm -hmm. And that the thing, that niches can uh, coalesce and come together and have power. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think, uh, I think the idea that things are flat in that sense, you know, uh, doesn't hold true. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, there's, that there's, I think what, what this idea of the long tail has essentially done is, is allowed the voices to kind of uh, have a platform mm -hmm, or be mm -hmm. able to speak. Mm -hmm. Like we have a platform here, <laughs> but there's also a platform in the audience out there. And there's, the, you know, there's the, the, you know, the weighted differently, mm -hmm. but there's still, but there, there's a, I guess there's an equivalency in terms of that tale, mm -hmm. but there's, there's, a, there's definitely a kind of, uh, I've lost my thread. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you mind if I, if I ask you about the seeing the objects online, um, I suppose in the welcome archive maybe or something? And then is, is the desire to immediately or to, to, to need to see it IRL before developing the, the ideas around it or is the online engagement with it enough to, to begin the yeah. ideas of, yeah? Well, part of that, part of that universal addressability. So, I did. It was. It came about through the Haywood Gallery. It's like a touring show, and, and you just asked to curate stuff. And I didn't want to. I, I don't know. I've used this line before, but now I don't like it. I didn't want to curate. I just wanted to aggregate, mm -hmm. right? I just wanted to bring things together, and and part of the impulse to do that was to was to meet these things. Mm -hmm. Was to was okay. to get to be intimate with them because right. I'd fallen in love with them and I wanted to I wanted to meet I'd stalk them online <laughs> and I wanted to meet them and um, but then when I did they were they were very disappointing they were very mundane <laughs> yeah. and they weren't the things that that had shone so brightly on the on the screen um, and so I scanned as many of them as I could and then replicated them. And then something about being able to do that allowed me to possess them. And then I loved them again. Because mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. they, they were kind of mine. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and I that, could have them. That word possession is so uh, kind of important, you know, both as individuals to be sort of possessed by mm -hmm. an idea or possessed by a love of something or, you know, possessed by a, mm -hmm. a passion for something. And do you think that you know what you're possessed by is what sort of drives your curiosity to find these things? Yeah. I do. Yeah. 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 Sam. No. Yes. Maybe. I, I. I mean, I suppose I, I just wanted to maybe um, respond um, to what Mark said there. Uh, that is so familiar. That kind of excitement and disappointment. The kind of roller coaster <laughs> of the relationship with. A source material or mm. an object or an artifact um, and it, it, th there is a, a, a relationship building and you know mm. sort of moving around and trying to you know so tr just just trying to find your you know sort of connection with with how to how to make um, this into into an artwork mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know for, for me 
processes, um, just like the one that you just described there, you know, are very often, you know, the way to the way to do that, and that's why I mentioned, you know, building in time and just being able to sometimes get hands-on, like the peace of mind that's there from Glasgow Sculpture Studios in Camden. Mm -hmm. um, it was a recasting of, a, of an anatomical mm -hmm. sort of um, dissection that had been plaster cast and just the, I wanted this object, I, I was in love with it, I wanted to spend months with it, recasting it, but I still didn't know what the artwork would be at the end. Mm -hmm. But through the process of recasting and finding things about, you know, the original foot must have been laid against a surface because the heel was all flat and I could only find that out by, you know, sort of getting underneath or, you know, then I was able to, when the plaster cast emerged, have an actual sort of real relationship with it and take it on to make it into yeah. to my work. But, you know, there was definitely a peaks and troughs and disappointments mm -hmm. and sadnesses and falling in and out of love yeah. process that happened in between. And there's Jeff Koon's uh, Shiny Rabbit up on the screen at the moment, <laughs> which appears in Mark's uh, Made in Evan yeah. um, from 2004. And just sort of, again, some kind of uh, thought in my head about when, as artists, you're using another artist's work. You know, you just talked about Barbara Hepworth, a bit of a fangirl response. And with the Koon's thing, I can only imagine that that was some kind of, you know, attraction repulsion thing with that work that you were drawn to. And I just wondered whether if it's, an artwork rather than a, a flute or a bridge freezer or a, a, a thing that's not an artwork. Do you think there's any uh, extra sort of need to sort of honour it or cite it or, or pay homage to it in a way that's not just about um, credit or not? I don't, yeah, I, mean, I don't know. It's something to do with luxury the and it's thing. something to do with owning things, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are things I made because I felt like I wasn't entitled to them, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know. Um, which now I don't, I, f I feel less, that just feels awkward now, because <laughs> I'm sitting up here, but. Um, <laughs> but it, yeah, it was some, some desire to, to obtain signifiers of, of, of kind of, yeah, of luxury, of mm -hmm. wealth, of, mm -hmm. or of, um, I don't know, high culture, mm -hmm. I guess, mm -hmm. in some ways. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, that's a perfect segue to that image, which has time lily appeared on screen of yours, Sam. These, um, we all know of them as plastic chairs. Everybody's seen them all over the world. Um, but these ones are not plastic, they're porcelain. And it's almost like sort of an inverse process of taking something that's uncredited, nobody knows, well, I imagine you might know who designed the original white plastic chair, but you know, there's such ubiquitous sort of anonymous things that are everywhere in the world, and yet with that piece you had them made as porcelain, am I right? Right, yeah. yeah. And the title of the piece is actually the credit of the person who made the porcelain piece. Right. I can't remember the title off the top of my head, but you will. Uh, well, the <laughs> yeah. Or not! <laughs> well, yeah. I was very interested. Yeah, I mean, I was I did, did uh, invited to do a a, uh, a work uh, for for a public sculpture show in the city of Xiamen in China, and uh, they invited a number of artists to come and produce work there in Xiamen, um, and then it would be exhibited there uh, and uh, put on by the city. And <laughs> Unfortunately, the, the, the exhibition never happened, but, but the, the, I was able to produce my, uh, my proposal for the show, which was to work with these porcelain makers whose you know, primary job was making um, uh, ceramic uh, decorative things for, for the temples in that region of China. So they were amazing craftsmen. And I, you know, I, <clears throat> being, uh, being interested in, in uh, design, furniture design and architecture. Um, for many years, I was a carpenter uh, builder uh, when I was younger. So, this kind of fascination about how things get made, and and um, uh, and and the intersection with um, uh, the kind of um, utopian ideas of the sort of mid-century modernist designers um, to produce 
good design at affordable costs to kind of democratize uh, um, healthy living, mm -hmm. <laughs> in a sense. Uh, anyway, those, those, those plastic chairs, they're, they're officially called monoblock resin chairs. Um, there's no patent on the manufacturer and there's no patent on the design. So if you have an injection molder, you can make those chairs, hence they're everywhere in the world. Uh, so um, I thought, uh, you know, China is sort of stereotypically, particularly at that time, was sort of stereotypically understood in the U.S. Um, as, as, a, as a kind of mass production of cheap uh, household goods, you know, that, that would be exported. And I like the kind of combination, you know, this sort of non sequitur of something very beautifully made and, and those are, those chairs, each one is individually made. They're not molded. Uh, they're hand made out of, out of ceramics, so they're unique. Um, and, and kind of, you know, connecting to that history, most of our technology actually originates in China, which in the U.S., we think we invented everything. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I like the kind of twist on that. And then t I titled them, each one was titled, and the title unfortunately doesn't appear here. <laughs> uh, it's the name of the people who made each chair in that factory. And the other thing I was interested in is the relationship to, to fabrication and labor in art. And, you know, this was also the, the moment when many artists from Europe and the U.S. were suddenly realizing they could manufacture their work That's there really cheaply. Um, and I, you know, I, I mean, from a kind of, I don't know, the ethics of that are, are debatable. Um, uh, but I liked pointing, at, pointing to that mm -hmm. um, kind of um, situation. Uh, and, and one of the ways I, 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 I used to, well, I often, um, credit the people who make my work, not in the title, but in the description of the work. And I noticed that usually when anything gets published, that part gets it's always dropped off. off. And this is a case in point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so I thought, well, if I just put the names of the people who made it in the title, it's always gonna have to get, but of course you shorten titles and things, so there's no mm -hmm. kind of perfect solution, but I was trying to address that problem mm -hmm. as well and point to issues of labor and craftsmanship um, and, you know, which I think is mm -hmm. part of mm -hmm. what you're interested in talking about yeah, here. Yeah. yeah, and I think also, you know, with each of these um, things to think about how things, whether they're credited, there's also the issue of how familiar they are. You know, nobody's using a, an object or a material that doesn't speak, you know, that doesn't have some way of communicating. And I guess, you know, with every element of content, whatever it might be, is there, a, is there a process that you would go through of thinking, well, are people going to know what this is? Is this familiar? Is it recognisable? Is it recognisable to one lot of people and not another lot? I mean, is that something that you think about when you're making work, or is that something that happens after the fact, do you think? Yeah, yeah. I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd definitely be thinking about it, well, in a day-to-day in a -day sort of way as you've described about how people would engage with it but also in its historical sort of context of materials as mm -hmm, well mm -hmm. and you know you've um, sort of talked a little bit about it Sam but the you know the whole kind of worldwide nature of materials like like china and porcelain and uh, cloth mm -hmm. cotton you know and you know not not everybody's aware of that but to me those kind of sort of stories are are, are always you know embedded in the materials mm -hmm, themselves mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. part of the work mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, when when you've worked a lot Christine with um, both sort of medical science mm -hmm. and and research scientists and so on and so forth I mean that sort of touches on a whole field of medical ethics yeah. and has there ever been a point in those discussions where it's um, you, you've sort of hit a wall with it, where the sort of field of ethics has meant that you've had to pull back from things that you've wanted to do with the material, or mm -hmm. has has there been any glitches in the matrix? Um, well, the, it's never it, it hasn't stopped me sort of getting to a point mm -hmm. where I could make a piece of work for the exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I suppose there are there are strict kind of ethical guidelines, but. 
you know, scientific, scientists tend to be quite pragmatic mm -hmm. about about these things, and usually, you know, display of of sort of human material. There are there are rules, mm -hmm. and you know, there's an engagement, there's a context, and usually, you know, you can. Yeah. You can sort of, get through you it. can get through yeah. it. So, I mean, I think it would be maybe in a, a moment we might get to the point of the, you know, the intention when making mm -hmm. work and what's going on at the process of making it, and then what happens yeah. afterwards. And it's timely again. Uh, these images really are on a random cycle. <laughs> we're not timing them to coincide with what we're saying. But some scaffolds just appeared on the screen beside us, and it might be the moment to talk about that, um, which was made originally for Documenta in. 2012 or 13, I think, was it? 12, yeah. 12, mm -hmm. and then it's subsequently been shown in numerous places, including in Scotland at uh, Jupiter Artland in 2013, I think. Um, and I'm sure... 14, maybe. 14, was 14, it? 14, maybe, um, yeah. It's a structure that's based on seven... Well, I should let you see what it is. Mm -hmm. But I thought it might be useful just to talk, um, first of all, about what the intention was when you made the piece and how it functioned in its initial iterations. And then, of course, in terms of what happens to something in the real world and uh, how responses to it can change dependent on time and place, it might be useful just to uh, refresh people's memories about what happened to it last year. Yeah, I imagine some people saw it at Jupiter yeah. when it was there. <coughs> um, uh, yeah, no, I mean, it was a... Uh, it, it was a... Uh, a fateful uh, situation that happened um, with the work that probably many people have read about, heard about. Um, uh, but originally, yeah, I, I, it was, a, it was a, a project that I started re researching in 2008. Um, and it was, it was really this idea of looking, I mean, you mentioned about history earlier, and I've always been fascinated with history. and, and uh, so it was, it was meant to look at the history of um, capital punishment in the United States and the relationship of the state to violence and even to reach into the idea of uh, imp you know, US imperialism. So, uh, and, and to touch on or connect to a little bit uh, mass incarceration, which is something probably many people have heard about, a um, huge issue in the United States. So I selected uh, seven uh, sort of noteworthy gallows, um, let's say gallows of historical significance throughout U.S. history, and, and put them together into one sort of uh, uh, somewhat recognizable, but also kind of what, what I hope was a kind of abstracted construction. Uh, and, then, and then that was meant to be used as a kind of platform um, you know, uh, f for people to congregate on the on the deck of it, find out what it is, have discussions, think about it, etc. And when it was in the Hague uh, after Documenta, it went to the Hague for a year, and that was where the, actually I was able to program it and worked with Amnesty International and a number of other organizations. Um, people involved with the international criminal courts there to do a series of programs using it as a kind of literal platform and stage. Um, and then it, it, um, it, came, it came down from The Hague and um, the Walker Art Center was interested in acquiring it for their uh, sculpture garden, which is in this um, very visible place in central uh, Minneapolis, and um, and eventually they did do that. And um, I, you know, in the kind of three or four years between when it uh, was in the Hague and when it was finally constructed, which would have been last around this time, last May, uh, in Minneapolis. Um, you know, I was doing all these other projects and it was sort of off my radar and thinking about it. Um, and uh, this structure went up in the middle of the city and, uh, and one of the, the well, the, the gallows that sort of forms the perimeter of it um, is called the Mankato Gallows, where the largest mass execution in U.S. history took place on that structure, 38. Uh, Dakota Indians were hung in a simultaneous kind of 
you know, act of brutality, just unbelievable. Um, ancestors of those people that were hung on that, on that platform um, still live in, in Minneapolis. And driving by on their way to the supermarket, taking their kids to school, whatever, recognized the structure and were just completely traumatized by it. They didn't know, what is this thing? What is it doing here? There was absolutely no um, uh, outreach to that community uh, done by the museum. So all of a sudden, the structure appears in the middle of the city, uh, and they recognized it and were just horrified, couldn't understand it. What is this thing? You know, this sort of monument to our genocide, basically, is what it was for them. Um, and so they connected with the activist community there and they started protesting it very quickly. And I became aware of it um, sort of a week before this sculpture garden was gonna reopen with all these new uh, artworks. Um, and and uh, they proposed a mediation uh, to talk with the, the community of Dakota elders, um, the museum people at the Walker Art Center and me uh, and we did that, and, um, and that, you know, was a very complicated, uh, difficult, but also kind of fascinating um, process. And, and, you know, in the end, I, I made the decision, or, or I agreed with their desire to have it taken down, because I felt like, well, you know, I'm, I'm on their side. <laughs> And I, you know, the last thing I want to do is have my work traumatize a community of people that, you know, um, are, are completely victimized by all these years of U.S. history that continue today. Um, so there's a lot of stories that they were telling me about what this thing meant for them, mm -hmm. how they felt about it. Um, and they're very powerful stories, and I, you know, I believe those stories, mm -hmm. and, and I don't want my work to traumatize, especially that group of people. Mm -hmm. So uh, I agreed to take it down. Um, I mean, I think it was gonna come down whether I agreed to it or not. Uh, <laughs> In a good way or a bad way. Yeah, well, and, and you know, um, that's a sort of overview of what happened, um, and you know, there's been a lot of discussion about who's to blame for this, so, you know, we always wanna find out, like, well, Whose fault is it? And you know, how do we fix this and make it all go away and make it all better? Um, but but you know, one of the things that's interesting about the process for me is that, in a way, this thing is never going to go away because um, there's now a whole kind of new situation, which is that the Walker Oats owns a work of art that they they can't um, actually reinstall without the permission of the Dakota and without my permission. So now there's a kind of three-part ownership of that work in a way that's very interesting. Um, so materially, it still exists, but it's not assembled. It's still, because there was talk at one point about it being burnt, but that didn't happen. No, so it still it, exists. It doesn't exist materially. No, okay. <laughs> Um, it exists, you know, I mean, this is an interesting thing because it also touches on the issue of ownership we were talking about, yeah. like the whole idea of appropriation is based on the idea that somebody owns whatever it is, mm -hmm. a thing or an idea or knowledge or whatever. Um, uh, so the walker still owns this idea, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and the Dakota own the ability to um, reproduce it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as the artist in US law, when you create something, um, I can't remember what it's called exactly, but you have a kind of the, basically the creator's right, which is in US law is an inalienable right. Mm -hmm. Once you create something. But that's not the same as copyright, or is it copyright? No, no it's, it's not the same. Right, yeah. right. So it's an interesting kind of legal, ethical, mm -hmm. you know, we have to keep all these sort of contradictory things in mind. Yeah. And, and that, to me, that's really interesting. It's yeah. not black and white. It's not, you know, yeah. this is right, this is wrong. Yeah. Um, there are all these contradictions that you have to keep in mind. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So as difficult as that is, I think it's, it's an interesting thing. And you, you, know, you, you, you beautifully described there this moment that happened when the piece was up 
and people were driving past it without knowing what it was, but they were able to recognise it, mm. which is kind of in incredible that, that it would still have this visual familiarity to people. Um, and of course, in many respects, that would seem like how it can communicate. You know, what we were talking about with objects, things that are familiar or recognisable have meaning, but of course, in that situation, its ability to speak as its original thing was its kind of downfall in a way because it, it spoke too quickly. It, it, it was out there before there was a, an opportunity or whether the opportunity would have been taken or not for it to be sort of discussed, really. I mean, do you, do you feel that there could or should have been more, um, you know, it, because it's an issue of proximity, really, isn't it? It's about it having been in other places that weren't in proximity with the places that are referenced in the piece, but then it was put in a place that's directly connected to a place that's referenced in the piece. Yeah, no, and, and it was it was like a, a an issue of a time and a you know a place for sure, yeah. but also a time uh, because that community had been doing a lot of education around that history, mm -hmm. the massacre, uh, and the history of what happened to the Dakota people in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. uh, I I was at the I did a residency in the at the Walker sort of ten years before that, and at that time there was very little knowledge. Mm -hmm of that history amongst the, the indigenous population there. So if the piece had gone up 10 years earlier, probably many Dakota people wouldn't have recognized it. Mm -hmm. So it's a it, very interesting kind of, you know, sort of coming together of a lot of different mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I learned, uh, you know, a very painful, mm -hmm. <laughs> difficult lesson about uh, symbols, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that, you know, I thought if you don't, if you're not picturing, or depicting, or representing suffering people, suffering bodies, then the danger of a kind of re-traumatization isn't there. Mm -hmm. And I, I learned that that's, you know, basically anything can sort of trigger that. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess you know that's what we're really talking about: these objects or materials that can function as as symbols as as something that, that has um, meaning. And uh, of course, things that are from your own personal repertoire, I'm thinking, Mark, about your, um, the film, was it last year you made Dream English Kid, which is quite, quite an autobiographical piece, it's fair to say. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of things that are, of course, personal, but also have resonance for other people. And it's, you know, I don't know how anyone could ever anticipate the extent to which those things that are in your Repertoire, how far they reach, how many other people would share them or, or uh, have the same response to them in a way. And I know with Dream English Kid, there's, there's some archival footage in it, but there's also some fabricated things, right? There's some things you had to. Yeah, it's. Yeah. it's I mean, the idea was to try and build, assemble something that was like an autobiographical thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, years ago, I, I think. I think it might have been done now, but I, I, had a, I had an idea when I was young to write my autobiography using other people's autobiographies, right? And it was something I thought I could piece together my autobiography or, or a kind of memories anyway, rather than... But the whole, I mean, the whole, the reason why I ended up making that is because, you know, when I went to art school a long time ago, I, I left art school very, uh, confused about art because I felt like a, I felt a kind of a inability within myself to kind of understand things. Everything seemed beyond my reach, you know, intellectually. You know, I couldn't. Uh, the kind of the theory at that time was to me impenetrable and it just seemed beyond me. And so I, I didn't make work when I left school for a long time. And the only reason I kind of came back to making art is that I, kind of, I, I realized that I could make work about things that were within myself, that were my own experience, essentially, mm -hmm. that were local to me, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that I understood implicitly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's where I kind of end up at Dream English Kid. Mm -hmm. And there's a kind of ownership there. I felt like I could own things. Yeah. 
But now there's things that I feel conflicted about in terms of my ownership with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Things like, uh, like I made these sound systems and they came out of my own history, my own experience of being uh, involved in rave culture. But now I, won't, I wouldn't show them now. I wouldn't show them now because I don't think it just seems they don't belong to me in that way now. In what respect mm. do they think you think they belong to a, a different time or? I just, I just, I think the more, that I think the problem is the more visible I make them, the more they become about me uh -huh. and the more of a claim I make on them. They and look they're, more I, like a Mark Lecky than yeah. a random sound system. Yeah, and they were, never, they were never mine in the first place. Yeah, yeah. You know, I just wanted to point to them, yeah. I guess. Or I just wanted to say that these things were kind of dynamic sculptures in themselves, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. that, they were, that they were powerful. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that I made that was about proving a kind of... the things that I grew up with had, you know, were as in intelligent and as charged and as, as beautiful and as powerful as, as anything within, within the art world. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, there was a kind of... I, 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 I kind of cl I had a chip on my shoulder, <laughs> essentially. Uh, and and just to pick up on that thing that you said about work that you made in the past that you would think twice about or maybe think differently about showing today. Yeah. I, I'm conscious I want to move on to some questions, and I've got two more questions to ask, both of which might be super quick for everybody. But one of them was about whether there are works. Um, I mean, Sam's had a really sort of extreme experience with Scaffold last year in terms of the transition of that going from being a piece to being in a complex ownership <coughs> situation that now means whether it's ever shown again is always going to be a complicated conversation. But are there other works from the past with any of you that you think, <laughs> actually, I can't show that now? Or something about the context, the proximity, the time, um, attitudes has changed that would make it very difficult to show. Now you don't need to say what piece it would be, <laughs> I suppose, but it'd just be interesting to think, um, looking back, if things have changed to such an extent that you would hold back on something. I feel like a, I feel like kind of everything's changed. <laughs> <laughs> in you know, I remember like the the moments I had. It was in I was in New York and I had, they had a Picabia show, and it, I just felt like. You know, I, I was inculcated with Picabia. You know, it's like there was a progression for me from Picabia to like Mike Kelly and to, you know, Katie Nolan, whatever, right? It was like, so Picabia. And then I walked around this Picabia show and I just thought, this no longer resonates in it. This belongs to another time. This belongs to another history, mm. you know, and it's not. It's not, it's, not, it's not contemporary, it has no relevance anymore, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or very little relevance, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and from then on, I've just, yeah, I felt like, because it's to do with sovereignty, mm -hmm. it's to do with the idea of, of a sovereign artist, mm -hmm. of, or a, a kind of, or a sense of autonomy, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. which up till that point, I think I've been following this idea that you could be, you know, it's kind of desire to be free. Mm -hmm. And have free reign over what you yeah. can use. Yeah. And I don't feel that anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and is that age and experience, perhaps? Or it's do you think that's It's age and it's also, I don't know, it's just the art world in itself. It just, it, it feels to me like a, it's always felt like a narrowing. It's, it's, I'm always conflicted mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and profoundly uncomfortable in it. <laughs> and it's just sort of reached the point where I'm, I think I'm too uncomfortable. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. And Christine? <laughs> um, in the early 90s, I was um, interested in forensic methodologies, and that took me into working and looking at people who were ballistics experts. And I started using shooting as part of the process of, of making work which was very exciting and interesting for lots of reasons. You know, one of them, you know, being turning up at, you know, 
the army and sort of saying, you know, I'd, I'd like to use, you know, shooting as a process to make a piece of work and that kind of entering these bastions um, and trying to sort of engage, you know, in a seemingly impossible situation, but actually kind of making it, making it happen. Um, so there was a whole series of works that came out of that sort of period of time, but when the Dunblane massacre happened um, in um, Scotland um, and a, a shooter went into a school, um, a situation that was unique here, it hadn't happened before, and killed a lot of pri primary school children, mm. then that seemed like a bit of a, the mm -hmm. real world has, has kind of entered mm -hmm. into that. So, mm -hmm. um, so I've moved away from that. Um, recently, I've been doing a lot of work looking at what the, the anniversary of World War I, and that's taken me to controlled explosions. So there's, there's maybe a way back into that territory somewhat, but it's a, it's a different perspective. But I also just wanted to comment after Sam's um, description of, of what happened there, that you know, thinking about works that go out into the world, as they inevitably must and should do, um, but the kind of initial context of making them can go far, far away from what you, you know, you mm. first sort of anticipated. I suppose I was thinking of a piece of mine that's depicted there, which is clay portrait busts that I asked um, sculptors to make um, from black and white grainy photocopies of images of Mengele um, that was made for you know, a specific location in this country, specific reason, but it ended up in a collection in Switzerland. But then um, it got borrowed for a group exhibition in the Jewish Museum in New York. And that was an incredibly sort of confrontation, not, uh, not a particularly good show. Um, I couldn't veto the borrowing of it. And I actually decided to go over and be part of the panel mm -hmm. kind of discussion and, and engage mm -hmm. in a way that, you know, I think you, you are absolutely kind of are obliged to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but that, that kind of anxiety, you know, of thinking of where is this piece going to, yep. where is it, where could Which it you end can't up? Which you, you can, you can but you, you, may, you may not mm. think about it at mm. first. Yeah. But, you know, the structures and the, the institutions and the market and all the rest mm -hmm. of it, you know, it, it can take it somewhere mm -hmm. that you, you may never mm -hmm. anticipate. So I don't know how you can be aware, but it is something that I do think about now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Sam? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm certainly, you know, <laughs> there's work from the past that, you know, kind of makes me cringe a little bit, but... Uh, that may be a different thing, though. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, and I, I mean, you know, that's who I was at that time, you know? It's, 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 I, I, I can totally relate to what Mark was saying, you know, when you're young and starting out, your relationship to, to what you perceive as the sort of um, uh, uh, the powerful players in the field and, and what's considered, you know, canonical, et cetera, your relationship to that changes once you become part of the, mm. you know, power structure yeah. in a sense. So, um, yeah, I mean, I did a lot of work when I was younger mm. that was that was sort of satirical and and um, uh, you know that now makes me kind of oh god, you know. <laughs> but but okay, that's yeah, that's part of life. And so, last question for me: <laughs> um, Have you ever come across anyone else? using your work and you know when you were just I've been on that thing where they they, they go where uh, you know like who wore it first there's a site that does who, who wore it first yeah there's a site called who wore it first right where I don't know they show people in the same dresses and they say who wore it, <laughs> right <laughs> and then they do that with with artworks <laughs> who did it first and I Someone made a giant blown up balloon animal and they put, and I made a big Felix mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they made it before me. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so I've been on that end. Right. At the other end of, uh, <laughs> at the other end were, of, uh, I, I mean, I don't care. No, okay. I mean, I've got, I mean, I'd like people, I'd, I'd, like, I put my videos up on YouTube yeah. in the hope that people will watch them. No, rip them and do something. <laughs> But no one ever does. 
uh, someone. Uh, well, there you are. You heard it here first, Mark. No, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> I, I, the idea of it just going circulating, circulating yeah. and going back in because I took it out. Yeah. That would. That would. Yeah. I'd, lo I'd, I'd love that idea. Mm -hmm. I don't have any. Um. I mean, all my stuff's kind of digital anyway, so it just seems mm -hmm. absurd mm -hmm. to kind of concern myself with copying. Mm -hmm. Although I do get, you know, I st I, but at the same time, I do get the huff when mm -hmm. I see someone doing like a bit of green screen or something. Yeah, I mean, like, that's oh, what I, I mean. That, that, there is, I mean? There's undoubtedly, I'm sure you must all have a certain moment that there's something you look at and you think, that's a bit like something I might have done. Yeah, no. but you have to let that go. <laughs> yeah. Do you? As long as, the, as long as they did it better than you would have. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the problem, yeah. yeah. No, that's fine. Then you don't have to do it, you know, <laughs> or do it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Christine, you have yeah, a Yeah, I, I suppose thinking um, about the, with that Barbara Hepworth work, the bottom line is, would I mind if yeah. somebody, you know, if there was an equivalent yeah. thing that someone did to yeah. from my piece of work? Um, and the answer would be, you know, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind. And I suppose when you work in universities as well, and you're always thinking about a kind of context for, you know, other other people doing similar things, that's a good thing, mm -hmm. you know, because you know, maybe trying to find out something that's related, you can talk to each other. There's a community. There's mm -hmm. so. So it's that know, fluidity it's, thing again yeah, about so cross reference and absolutely cross pollination and and, and, and you know. Well, you know, grew up in a, a culture very much about that amongst sort mm -hmm. of artists working together across each other, <coughs> collaborating, you know, it's, yep. it's healthy, yep. definitely. Sam, anything to add on that note? Seen any rip-off Sam Gerrites out there in the world? I, I, I'm remarkably uh, not very aware of much that's going on, so there might be. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, but I, I, I just I wanted to just mention something that Christine said, which was you know about the early work that you did with ballistics, and then mm. you know you came back in a way. Now mm. you're working in you know with a similar kind of yeah. thing, but in a different way. And I think that's a really interesting thing to me is that you know the theory of freedom of expression, freedom of ex of speech, is that anyone can say anything uh, uh, about anything. And, and the question is just then how you do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, you know, there's certain things maybe you don't have to say something about. You don't, you know, it doesn't mean you should do it. Yeah. Um, but, I, but I really like that. I think that's a really great way of, you know, because I thought about that with Scaffold and that was also one of the decisions that I thought um, that the piece should be taken down and given to the Dakota because I realized, wow, you know, if I had just talked to them in the beginning, I never would have made the work like this. Yeah. So I could make a work about this issue. I would just do it differently. Yeah. And and I think that's a really mm. great example of that. Yeah. Okay. Well, if everybody's willing, I think we'll open up to some questions from the floor. Um, the brilliant Adam is over there with a the microphone. So if you do want to ask a question, please do just wait until Adam gets to you with his handy roving mic. <laughs> Um, would anybody like to go first? This is always when the awkward silence happens and everyone looks at their shoes and their phones. But <laughs> there's one there, there we go. Hello. Uh, do you think there's a risk of work becoming uh, overtly bland or uh, extensively autobiographical because people are afraid of working with any subject matter that they can't claim to either be their own experience or just to be no experience, I suppose. Okay. Do you want to go first? Me? Yeah. I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave. I'll, I'll, I didn't quite understand the question. <laughs> so. Someone who can understand. The yeah, answer. you guys go ahead. <laughs> so, um, I, just to paraphrase, maybe um, for clarity, that people feel that only subject matter that they've got absolutely direct experience of is something that they can use um, as the subject matter of for the work yeah um, I, w I would say that that's a fine place to start um, and not not to be worried by starting there but equally you know not not to be worried about starting in the other place but I think 
generally, you know, if you think about sort of younger artists at, at art school, um, tr looking around for places to start, that would generally be somewhere that feels kind of comfortable. But as soon as you start, then you've got a world of reference points. You've got like a, an ever increasing circles um, to go out in. So um, I, I, I I would, I would feel, I feel, I would feel perfectly comfortable with someone sort of starting there. But then, you know, it's your, it's your window then to look out um, if that's what makes you feel more comfortable. Mark, do you want to add anything? Um, does it does it need to blandness? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't. Not at all. <laughs> I don't think so. I think it's like, I mean, the bit I feel find bland is, is, is like. I think I think when you go to art school, you're, you're, you you get lost. A lot of people get lost when you first go to art school, and in your in your kind of vagueness, there you start you start to realise there's this there's this structure that allows you to produce art. There's like a way of making art, you know, yeah. like up here, like the Glasgow Lean. Remember when everyone was leaning sticks? <laughs> So you can, so you can, you know, and you go, oh look, I can lean a stick, and you learn how to lean a stick like everyone else, and you make, you make art, you know, and it's presentable, and and everyone accepts it and can talk about it, and in a group crit, yeah. But I don't, I find that bland. I'd rather someone is trying to involve themselves with their desires and their anxieties or whatever. I'd much rather that, yeah. I mean, I don't want. Lots of expressionistic angst, but <laughs> I think it has to it has to go through your body somehow. It has to be lived in some way, otherwise it, it hasn't got much value. I don't, I don't for me. Okay. Can we have another? I think there was another question over here, right at the far end. Adam, thanks. Hello. Uh, I had a question about if at some point each of you find yourself to feel quite privileged as artists to be able to remix other things. I think remixing is quite fun to do as students and really important. But I was kind of curious about this idea of when you do realize how much privilege you have, do you ever feel like there's this idea that maybe one of the better things you might need to do is to get out of the way of other artists who maybe get less representation? Not to say like, you yeah. know, other artists are better. I'm just thinking in terms of uh, if you ever feel a responsibility because they would be related to this idea that you might end up getting into when you work with other people's things, um, or do you think that's not even possible if there's like such an economic influence in contemporary art? Yeah. Yeah. I, f I, yeah. I feel that like massively at the moment, yeah. That's why it's one of the things about feeling uncomfortable. I mean, it's like... In terms of privilege, you know, I, like I was trying to say before, I felt like, you know, art was never something I felt entitled to, so I never felt that privilege. But, um, but you know, I've been in art now for 20, 30 years, and that's those circumstances and, and myself have changed. Um, so why am I still there? <laughs> you know, I don't. I mean, I'm. I don't know. I'm struggling with it. I don't. I don't. Uh, I mean, art to me is like one part a kind of joy, and one part that crippling doubt. <laughs> you know, uh, and the crippling doubt is crippling me <laughs> at the moment. It's uh, in all sorts of ways. You know, um, I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to involve myself in other ways, like uh, so I can step back in some way. That's yeah, it's as vague as that. <laughs> Sam, do you want to add in, or Christine, do you want to add in? <clears throat> Um, I think maybe now that the, the road behind is, is quite long <laughs> as, a, as, a, as an artist, um, it, 
it, it feels a wee bit more kind of real to me and I uh, maybe these kind of overt anxieties are levelling out because I've seen, you know, so many, th there's been so many, you know, you're doing well, everybody loves you, you're not doing well, nobody likes you, you can only survive because you've got a teaching job, you can only survive because you do this, you have to do a bit of that, um, you come, things come, things go, you're in an amazing position, you get a fantastic commission, nobody pays you for two years. And so these moments where, you know, at the moment, um, I, I'm having a great year and I'm absolutely loving it, but I can see, you know, I can see the stretches ahead where, you know, some of that stuff will come back round again in, in circles of, you know, whether it's to do with fashion, the market or whatever it is, or age or, you know, buzzwords or, or whatever. Um, it's a, it seems like a, 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 it's a rather strange career, but at the moment, maybe just I'm feeling okay about it. <laughs> Sam, how are you feeling? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, yeah, um, no, it's a good question. I mean, um, I, and, I, and I think I understood it, the idea that, you know, uh, when should one step aside and let uh, mm -hmm. others come in? Um, you know, and one of the unfortunate things about the, the sort of, um, let's say, how capitalism works, um, is that it's a zero-sum game, and, and nobody needs an artwork. Mm -hmm. So uh, the competition is fierce to get, you know, your work into one of the sl potential slots, exhibitions, galleries, museums, all that stuff. So, um, and like you were saying, Christine, uh, for most of us, it is an incredibly difficult um, mode of survival. I mean, I, I teach because I can't make a living uh, off my work. So um, it's not exactly, uh, although it, you know, you use the word privilege, it's a privilege to be able to uh, show your work and, and have your work seen um, uh, and, and be able, you know, have people take it seriously, yeah. for sure. Um, but I, I, I guess I would, and I have all my life, worked to open that door to others. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's funny for me because I, I think it's also a generational thing. Um, you know, we, we, when I was uh, trained as an artist coming up into the art world, there was, there was really not, not much of a commercial art world and nobody really thought about making money on selling art. Uh, and that's all changed lately. Mm. So the stakes have changed with that and the perception of what it is has, has, has changed with that. But one of the, and one of the things that's interesting about that is that you, you know, when I came up, you, you would never sort of tell anyone what you were doing uh, or, or say what opportunity, you, you know, it was very, you, the, the modesty was the way to do it. Yeah. And with social media, that's all changed. Yeah. It's a, the opposite now. And I have a hard time adapting to that. You've got to constantly tell people everything you've done. And, and it, it's created a situation where, uh, you know, maybe my theory is that, that, um, uh, that, that nobody does any research into what you've done, actually, unless they can easily find it on social media. So I find myself in a kind of paradoxical situation where I don't want to keep telling people what I've done, mm -hmm. you know, my sort of bona fides <laughs> as an activist, as an organizer, as somebody who's tried to change systems and create opportunities in, in the institutions that I work in. Um, but I realized that I probably should do that. <laughs> so I'll start here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for that question. Uh, uh, is there any more questions from the floor? There's one here at the middle. Then we're definitely coming over to this side of the room. Um, I just think I can maybe contribute something to uh, what you were saying, Sam, about the moral rights of artists and um, ownership and the afterlife of artworks, because what you were referring to is the Visual Artists' um, Right Act that was established in the US in 1990 and it has the right of attribution and, as you were saying, the right of um, integrity. But for um, contemporary artists, it's actually a little bit murky because 
in the small print, it's, um, it lists very specifically what kind of artworks it applies to and not necess it's really unclear if it actually applies to installation art, for example. So um, basically, with, uh, if you want to be sure, I think you shouldn't rely on VARA, on the Visual Artists Moral Rights Act, but um, rather on contracts actually to protect your um, wishes for your works. Okay, that's helpful advice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks very much. Any questions from the other side of the room? <laughs> Oh, one at that far corner. <laughs> no protest on this side. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I think one of you said you'd been working for about 20 or 30 years, so I'm going to assume that, uh, well, my question is, do you think that some of the definitions or the uh, language around appropriation has changed over the past, say, 20 years as intellectual property has become more valuable and perhaps is more likely to then be policed by organizations that are profiting off it? Okay, that's a good question. Who would like to tackle that? Whether the growth or the increase in the idea of intellectual property has made a difference to the discussion of appropriation? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I haven't really got what you're asking. No, it's kind of gone over my head. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> You'd have to. Can you? Can you, can say you phrase it again? that again, Corn? Sorry, could you just say it again? again? Say it again or elaborate on it. Elaborate on it a little bit, please. Well, I suppose I sometimes wonder about sort of like when I was in art school, we sort of talked about artists learning from copying other artists. That was sort of the yeah. way that you um, continued lineages or celebrated each other. But when I think about, say, I think if a commercial photographer, like you might buy the rights to, say, taking the photograph of Kennedy going along in his car, and then when he's shot, you profit off the sale or the reproduction of that one image. And so I'm just wondering about, as particular systems grow more powerful and they begin more and more to narrate what appropriation or what borrowing means, how do communities that perhaps have less power um, economically or in terms of um, popular enunciation um, foreground some of their histories um, of uh, speaking together? Mm -hmm. Does that elaborate on it usefully or more confusingly? Or is yeah, no, it's good. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the, the, for instance, the, f the pharmaceutical industry, um, you know, traveling through uh, Africa and, uh, and South America into indigenous communities and, um, you know, b basically trying to patent all of the, you know, indigenous uh, medicinal plants and herbs and remedies and things, you know. Maybe if that's what you're referring to, yeah, how, how, how does one protect for instance, in an indigenous community in the Amazon, uh, how do they protect their rights to um, uh, their, their um, medicinal plants and things like that? I mean, I, I think it's just a function of, of capitalism. And, you know, we're not going to solve it using capitalism. <laughs> we're going to solve it by dealing with the, these inequities within that system. So yeah, I think it, it's it's a kind of it's a it's a big system that intellectual property is part of. Mm. That's what that's what I would say. Yeah. yeah, I suppose my experience in dealing with it and the work has been um, also in in, med in medicine and genetics and the ownership of you know bodily material who owns you know who who has the rights to. I'm just thinking, for example, of a, a work I made early on where I was, um, it was the moment of, you know, the, the race for the human genome and um, the race for the, the money <laughs> behind the human genome and being um, in a genetics institute and being shown various different kind of cell cultures and cell lines that were being developed to, to trial drugs. Um, um, and the, the, the cells were continually referred to as HeLa cells, which I thought they were, the people 
who were talking to me were saying healer. But when I asked them to talk about it more, they said, no, HELA, H-E-L-A, H, capital H, small E, capital L, small A. And it's an abbreviation for someone's name. And her name is Henrietta Lacks. And now people hopefully <coughs> know the story more, but um, she was a person who, in the 50s, um, when scientists were looking around for trying to, trying to, find um, cells to freeze and then reanimate and develop into cultures um, without her permission. Um, she was an African-American woman in Baltimore and her um, cancer tumour was removed and a test was done on the very virulent cells within um, that cancer tumour and they were, they became the first cell line and before, well, very shortly after she died, they were then being sent all over the world and they started to have a huge commercial value and her family weren't, you know, told anything about this until decades and decades later and there was a battle ensued to try to get A, recognition and B, some financial recompense. So the recognition has come somewhat but not the financial recompense, even though a gazillion <laughs> of pound dollars worth of, of drugs have been developed on the, on the, on the cells. So that, that's been my particular kind of experience and the, these examples are, are rife within, within medicine and um, science. Okay, the other side of the room. <laughs> <coughs> Um, I suppose it's a bit of a daft one, really, about social media, but uh, in a way that, you know, there's all these kind of complex kind of discussions about ownership and things and all this, but I suppose with all this stuff with Facebook recently and Instagram and everything, really, you know, there's a sense in which, you know, you sort of quibble all over the kind of definitions of these things, but for most people, they're just sort of, you know, giving these things away all the time anyway. And it sort of seems to yet to have come to a sort of point with any of these people that the sort of ownership of these things, which is all sort of hotly contested and all these terms and conditions that nobody actually ever reads, even with the other Facebook thing and you kind of have to do it all again, you still don't read them and just kind of click accept it or whatever. But, you know, what does everybody think about the sense that maybe that is actually more than any of the other things we're talking about, changing the way that everybody understands, you know, this shared sort of palimpsest of things that just sort of stack up in this sort of pile, you know, without really kind of having any shape or sort of definition and mm -hmm. how they might be used again. Really. And specifically around images or ownership <laughs> of images? Or? I suppose it is images, but, you know, also suppose with sort of, well, they're not even really called hyperlinks and that, is it? It's just like links to things, you know, mm -hmm. that are sort of, I suppose that's another question about, you know, you just tailor your whole sort of profile to kind of, you know, make your own bubble sort of thing and, mm -hmm. you know, everything's sort of hunky-dory and that, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, images maybe, you know. Anybody want to come back on? Christine that? first. Christine. <laughs> well, we're always talking about You mean my media. cute cat pictures? <laughs> I didn't understand Kitten that guy's pictures. accent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Comment on that one. <laughs> oh, very good. No, I think that has to be passed over here to the, <laughs> to the master of, of all things Tinternet. <laughs> Tinternet. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm having problems understanding. Not your accent. <laughs> but, uh, but the question. I'm not, I, don't, I, I'm having a, I, had a, I had a bad night last night. Yeah. I'm struggling. I can suppose it just mean like, you know, there's the... All the sort of copyright and the things you were talking about, Sam, and I mean, I suppose that's more fundamental about actually how works exist and ownership, but really, who cares in a way? You know, it's just, uh, you know, you do a show, either you do it or the gallery does it, or pump out all these images, like, say, Mark, if you work at Tramway, and, you know, it's almost like you don't have to go and see it, really, you know, you yeah, can sort right. of look at the pictures and kind of hear a wee clip that somebody did on a shitty video on their phone, and you sort of get the gist of it, you know? And you could almost probably say you saw it and kind of, you know, just tough it out and sort of yeah. probably believe it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Do we Obviously, we're not condoning shows? that in a way of being expected. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah I, no, all right, yeah. Because I think, 
I think, you know, there's something, you know, our keeps, you know, it's since the 60s, I guess, and, and kind of like ideas of dematerialization and like Michael Free talking about, you know, theatrical, the theatricality of minimism, minimalism, minimism, um, that you, that, that the artwork is always getting extended, you know, it's losing its, it's lost its objecthood a long time ago, in a sense, it keeps returning because, I guess, cause, partly because of the market, as a demand for objects, um, but in any real sense, in any kind of social, cultural sense, it's kind of, the, the object's not where it's at anymore, do you know what I mean? So it's a kind of extended situation. Um, and yet we still have this craving to be with materials. Oh, you know, definitely. To be with I don't things. know, do we? I'm not so sure. There's a lot of people out and about in the streets yeah. of Glasgow craving to be with materials <laughs> today. <laughs> and and, but there's and to also... return to craft, and to return to the crafts that are, well, maybe not fleshers, but um, <laughs> <laughs> that, are, that are described here. Um, yeah. You know, that... I don't know whether that's a backlash or, yeah. or, or not, but yeah. I do think I, 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 I'm one of them. I, I want to I want to engage with craft and materials, but it is very hard to do an exhibition without having a phone or a camera being shoved at you and asked to do your three minutes summing up. And as you can tell, I, I I'm absolutely rubbish at three minute summaries. Most things that I do take minimum, you know, <laughs> half an hour to describe. So. I don't know. <laughs> well, I think on that note, and given the time, it might be time to repair for a drink. I think there are drinks being served in the room next door, um, if we'd all like to repair there. Um, I want to, again, say a big thanks uh, to Jeremy and the team from National Sculpture Centre for coming to Glasgow and for helping make this whole thing happen. But I'm also keen that everyone in the room thanks Mark and Christine and Sam for being here in person as material entities and not just being on Skype, for being so generous with both their time and their brains. And also, you know, it bears repeating that artists make work so they don't have to speak and then we keep asking them to come and speak. So it's not a given that an artist will come and be so uh, honest and forthright and generous with your thoughts. And I'm so indebted to all three of you for being here. Thanks so much. Thank you.